Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Donna Bernard, Steering Committee Member of IDR's Entrepreneurship and Innovation NJCU Jersey City Connect Project. The approach of the IDR goes beyond the boundaries of conventional disciplines and organizes teaching and learning around the construction and meaning of real world problems and themes. There is no single lens to view, explore, and embrace the variety of thought, idea creation. Local becomes global, global becomes local, and this is our community. <clears throat> My participation with the Institute and the collaboration with the students this, this uh, semester has truly inspired me. In the midst of the pandemic, we have witnessed the growth of our students to expand their possibilities at a time when it's never more important to stand up and be present. To engage at a higher level takes inner strength, passion, and the commitment to become an innovator, living life with a sense of purpose. We treasure our students and view them as key components in making the world more harmonious by applying a transdisciplinary academic approach. What the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Division reflects is a driving, driving force for cultivation of the entire Institute's platform. This mission is driven under the stewardship of its founder and director, Professor David Weiss, the IDR family and the IDR's ecosystem. Achieved through a process of principles embedded within ESG, which is defined to focus on the environment, social and corporate governance bolstering STEAM and STEM in our state. The Entrepreneurship Club at NJCU embodies idea creation through the next generation of our young minds. I'd like you all to take a moment and imagine yourself standing atop a cliff. Outstretched before you is the infinite horizon, above you, the sun. Across your back are huge, powerful wings. You prepare to soar into the air, knowing you will be supported. This is what the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Division does. Our Entrepreneurship Club develops creative leaders with optimism and joy for the future. And now I am delighted to introduce Kelly McKenna, one of IDR's undergraduate research assistant and president of NJCU's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Club. Thank you, Donna. So my name is Kelly McKenna and I'm the president of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Club here at New Jersey City University. I'm also a member of the IDR, the Institute for Dispute Resolution as well, and part of their family. And I wanna thank you guys all for coming today. So a poll now should pop up on your screen um, and it'll just take 30 seconds to answer. So just please, when it pops up, make sure you answer that. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for answering those questions, just so we have that information. So again, I wanna introduce you to our first guest speaker who is also my mother, Regina Napielny. She is a STEAM teacher at Scholars Academy with a double major in mathematics and computer science from NYU, and has also been working towards her gifted education certification at Rutgers University. Mrs. Nabielny challenges her students with a variety of hands-on activities that include the design engineering process, simple machines, coding, robotics, and also cost curricular connections. She will now give you a better understanding of herself and her STEAM activities. Take it away, mom. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon. My name is Regina Nadbielny, and I am a STEAM teacher in Orange, New Jersey, now in my seventh year of teaching. My first career was as a computer programmer on Wall Street, which I did for 11 years. After taking time off to raise my two children, I went to Seton Hall University to earn a master's degree in education with a concentration in instructional design and technology. I am pass passionate about computer science and teaching the next generation about coding. I was always interested in technology, so a career in computer science and later as a STEAM teacher has fulfilled my dreams. Is a STEAM or STEM career right for you? Do you like to solve interesting and challenging problems? Do you like to be creative and work with others? Do you like to work on projects that make a difference? Do you wanna earn a good salary and enjoy job flexibility? Do you want to challenge the world, change the world? If so, then a STEM career would be a great choice for you. The reality is that technology affects every field of commerce. In healthcare, computing is part of operating rooms every day and it is enabling breakthroughs like these contact lenses that detect levels of insulin for people with diabetes. In space, we are depending on a generation of robots to explore where humans cannot go. In our homes, we are automating everyday things like our heating systems. On our roads, we depend on navigation systems to get us home, and now we are experimenting with bringing self-driving cars into our everyday lives. In entertainment, blockbuster movies depend on computer science to bring new characters to life and provide us new, completely animated worlds. And every single day, this trend is growing across every single industry. And there are job openings across all industries <coughs> and in every state. There are more than 500,000 open jobs in computing right now, representing the number one source of new wages in the United States. And these jobs are projected to grow at twice the rate of all other jobs. There is also a shortage of women, black and Hispanic people who choose to go into STEM majors and careers. Women only make up 28% of the workforce in STEM fields in college. The gender gaps are particularly high in some of the fastest growing and highest paid jobs of the future, like computer science and engineering. Black and Hispanic workers continue to be underrepresented in the STEM workforce. The typical STEM worker now earns two thirds more than non-STEM workers. There is a major opportunity for women and other minorities to enter STEM majors and careers. Do you like to program or draw? Do you like math or foreign languages? Do you like science or forensics, sports or entertainment? Then a cybersecurity career might be for you. There's a lot of job demand in cybersecurity. The pay is very good, even at the beginning of your career with a minimum of $50,000 and some jobs start at over $100,000. You are needed. Hackers are attacking our hospitals, our power grids, our transportation. We need cyber defenders because these attacks threaten our day-to-day -day safety. Right now, there are 500,000 unfilled jobs in the US because there aren't enough cybersecurity professionals and is expected to go up to 1 million in the next five years. If you are interested in a possible career in cybersecurity, there's a lot more information at cyberseek.org. Whatever career path you choose, the best job is the one where you are happy every day to wake up and go to work. You should try to choose a career where you find the tasks engaging and rewarding. But students, you should consider if you're interested in a career in cybersecurity, the entry level, level jobs pay very well. The possibility for STEM careers are endless. One STEM career that fascinated me was a doctor who performed a surgery 250 miles away using a robot. From a console in Canada, he controlled a robot surgeon 
in an entirely different part of the country, slicing, stitching, and removing bits of the body. He has carried out more than 20 operations so far. I think universities should provide mentors to students in STEAM fields and require at least one coding class as part of the requirements. I wish you all good luck in whatever path that you choose. Thank you. Thank you for adding that intel um, and for all the different possibilities that you can do with STEAM and everything that relates to it as well. It's just very fascinating. Next, I want to introduce Paul Amelia. Through his business ventures, he has become an established visual communicator and excels at brand recognition and equity. He is also an advertising professional, author of Jack and Zach, The Talk of the Town, scientist and inventor. Mr. Amelia will now give more insight to his world. Thank you for that kind introduction, Kelly. <clears throat> I um, graduated from Syracuse University. And when I graduated, um, I found my first job in advertising. <clears throat> and most people think that you get a job right away. It took me eight months. And um, during those eight months, I spent a lot of time pounding the pavement and searching for work. Unlike now where you have smartphones, back then we used uh, pay phones. I used to walk around with a lot of jingle in my pocket and now they're used as uh, respiratory, uh, <laughs> the restrooms. So unfortunately they have to remove them as quickly as possible. But for the most part, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, understanding how to brand, create brands and build brand equity. And it's one of the first things you probably should do as an entrepreneur, if you have your own company. And most people don't realize that, but, but um, as you start to begin to understand your own brand, you can actually promote it. You prom the, your brand becomes a part of you and you become part of your brand. And that's how it generally works. If you look at most successful companies, you can almost identify who the uh, creator of the company is instantaneously as soon as you mention the company name. And visually, the brand equity has to work as well because something starts out as a uh, gray swiggly line like the Nike swoosh and all of a sudden it becomes a brand known all over the world. So that's my specialty. But as I became more integrated into business, I started to realize that there's a bit, a bigger world out there than selling products to people that don't really need them. And the best thing to do was to create something that was gonna create uh, more of a synergistic opportunity to build communities and share with them the value of what they can actually gain from products that they actually need. So I started to understand more and more about how to create innovation and sharing that innovation, but Innovation doesn't come from one person, it comes from multiple people. And we realized too that one great innovation deserves another. And the, the coalition of brands is usually what makes us better people. So my job now is to uh, help people who come up with great ideas and help brand them and take them to market, help fund them and find various different ways to um, share that with the world because technically, we're all a part of each other. We, we interface, we, we're part of one giant ecosystem ourselves, just like you know, some, of the, some of the animals that become extinct, they, they, we lose a part of us as well. Um, right now I have two companies, one's called Wolf Moon, uh, W-O-O-F-M-O-O-N.com, that's my advertising business. And my other one is VoltaHive.com. And we call it VoltaHive because initially we were bringing energy together to get off the grid. But then I find that more uh, opportunities come from various different angles. So helping people with their innovation grow is what I do. Did I go too far? <laughs> and I, I think that's the extent of it. I don't know what, what more I can share, but um, if there's uh, people out there who want to learn more about how to build their brand, you can contact me or share your information. And if you have something that seems of value. Maybe we can talk a little further about how to take it, the brand further. I was part of a Startup New York program, which is now a NICRIN, which is New York Regional Innovation Node Program. And it's not just um, in New York, it's broad spectrum throughout the country. And you can take advantage of that program. Um, I can show you how to get there and how to do that. And that, that program actually helps take your brand to the next level and potentially to market. All right, thanks Paul for your insight about entrepreneurship and finding a solution. And I wanna finally introduce Zachary Whitman who has been patiently waiting. 
Mr. Whitman is now going to go into detail about himself, his business, artificial intelligence, and agriculture. Mr. Whitman is the CEO of Grow Squares, a modular gardening solution at the intersection of nature and technology with custom engineering and digital resources based in Brooklyn, New York. So how does nat nature, engineering, and technology all come together? Mr. Whitman will now explain. Kelly, thank you so much for the lovely intro. Um, so I'm going to parrot a bit about what Regina said. So she talked about the importance of STEAM careers. Um, and I think that what we've built over here um, really sort of highlights that. Um, so let me tell you a little myself and then the company. So um, uh, I got out of school. I went to a place called Carnegie Mellon. I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, and I think like a lot of people, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go to grad school because then it defers my choice in actually making a career. Um, did the same thing. I went to a place called MIT. Um, got out of there. And um, I think following the pack is really what I was good at at a certain point. I knew, okay, well, I knew some smart guys that were going into Wall Street. So I did the same thing. It wasn't really a choice. It was just something that seemed pretty obvious. So um, I ended up becoming an investment banker, ultimately becoming uh, working in the hedge fund industry. Um, but I'll be 100% honest, I never really loved it. Like it was cool. I like being surrounded by smart guys, um, smart, smart women. Um, and that was really exciting um, to feel like every day I could learn something. Um, but I knew most of the time that I was really doing something I didn't necessarily love. And to, again, to parrot Regina's kind of sage advice, if you find yourself doing something you don't really love and you're young enough, it's worth taking a look outside. So, you know, probably for about a year or so, I was thinking, well, what is it that, that I think I'm passionate about? And I'd always gardened. Um, seems like a little bit uh, esoteric or something a little bit off from from what I think a lot of people thought, but you know, it's something I kept coming back to. I just get so excited, uh, you know, at the beginning of, of spring, um, have a chance to kind of get my hands dirty. And I knew that ah, I'm pretty good at math and science, um, again, from the, from the STEAM education I received. So I thought, hey, how can I combine these things, right? Is there an opportunity for me to take my passion um, and my unique perspective um, from, uh, you know, that pursuit and sort of STEAM um, into something that I can come up with a little bit different than someone else? Um, so I founded this company, it's called Grow Squares. Um, let me show my screen. Give me a second, guys. So I'll tell you, I'll give you the few kind of highlights about this, um, just to give you a little overview of what we're doing over here. So Grow Squares, um, again, intersection of nature and technology. Um, and so um, what we do is we have this assumption, most people kind of mess up in their garden. Um, about two thirds of people grow, uh, you know, fail in, at their gardening. So just extreme dissatisfaction. It should be a pleasure. Um, but unfortunately, just it's tough, right? Everybody has unique environments. 90% uh, of people don't even know the right plants for their own neighborhood. And so what we do is we spend a lot of time really creating a, a package um, that's super simple, super fun, um, and really kind of personalized for everyone's space. So um, what we do is we deliver square foot gardens. Um, these are square foot modules containing everything somebody needs for one particular plant. Um, and then we have created an app to help you out along the way. So it's a little weird when people think apps and gardens, they're, they're not necessarily the most obvious pairing. Um, but so what this app primarily is done is we tell you, we tell us exactly size and shape of your particular garden. Um, you take your phone, place it down on the ground. We measure a whole bunch of factors that contribute to the success of your garden. So, um, you know, sunlight, orientation, wind levels, um, all of these things. And then we ultimately also do is identify the right plants for your particular space. So not only do we tell you the right plants for your space, but we're able to identify what's missing in your soil, the nutrients, minerals, and bacteria that you could benefit when creating this whole kind of holistic gardening system. We take those individual attributes, kind of stick them all together in this, um, this uh, one square foot block, and we, uh, we pre-inject the seeds of the particular plant that you're growing and wrap them in this nutrient-rich casing. Um, take all of these individual modules, wrap them all together, ship them out to users, where the app really tells you, once you receive it, the best configuration of plants. So what should grow next to each other? Because there are all this whole idea of, you know, an eggplant shouldn't grow next to, um, you know, a tomato, they compete in nitrogen. All of this stuff is codified and we have a huge database of telling us what's the best thing. So not only does it tell you kind of what the right plants to grow, helps you out along the way. So we track weather, we track the plant biology, tell you how much to water, when to pick, you know, all of the really simplified paint by number system. Um, done with a whole kind of focus on, on really everyone's individual space and our unique understanding of the biology of plants and how weather works. So these plants themselves or these squares themselves, they're made of a whole 
bunch of cool things. We got about 20 different components that go inside of the soil mixture. Um, we have a, an outside casing that's all biodegradable. It's made up of actually um, a type of palm leaf that falls uh, naturally, um, all kind of engineered to be uh, you know, biodegradable for the exact amount of time that it takes to grow one particular plant. I think also looks pretty cool. And we spent a lot of time in terms of the industrial engineering side of things. Um, that app does, in addition to what we talked about in terms of recommending the right plants and telling you how much to grow, um, you can take a picture of any of a plant and they'll tell you, okay, well, this is, might be a type of disease or a pest infestation. All of this stuff is done to ensure that everybody grows the right stuff for them. And if you have a problem, it's we're as easy as a kind of a click away to solve that issue. We, again, do this really deep analysis of spaces. So, um, for example, this is actually uh, one of the guys who, who lives with us uh, or lives in, uh, works in the company. Um, this is his balcony and this is his house. So we actually measure sunlight on a one centimeter uh, basis, one a squared centimeter basis. So, you know, you can stick out your hand. I can tell you how much sunlight each finger receives. We do the whole thing with, with wind, with sunlight, um, with, uh, um, you know, soil taxonomy, all really done personalized. We think the data science and remote science assessment uh, becomes really the key. So have a product, as you can imagine, with an app, it skews a little bit younger um, and a little bit wealthier just because of the price point. But um, interestingly enough, the two sub-segments that gardening is growing the, the fastest, so this would be young families um, and millennials, they're actually the, the, two, um, the two places where we have the most traction. Again, I think that it's a great solution for the space. I'm kind of bore you. I won't bore you with any of the numbers here. Um, but ultimately, what we've done is, you know, we've really spent a lot of time ensuring that We've devised a solution that piggybacks off of um, remote uh, remote climate analysis. So this would be data scientists, engineers, designers, um, you know, uh, soil scientists. Really, that whole steam architecture to come together with a product that people really love, and and I think again proves the importance of you know getting out of school, pursuing something that you really enjoy, um, and also you know having something either in the hard sciences or uh, at least in the design field. Um, that can really kind of further your career because the opportunities are, you know, close to limitless. Um, yep. Thank you so much for your time, guys. All right. Thank you for that and for your position in growth squares and how you use technology to go with something that may not be thought of as paired together. Um, and then last, but certainly, certainly not least, I'm excited to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Jack Hillian. With several decades of experience in various industries, his portfolio includes strategic guidance for C-level leaders of Fortune 500 type organizations while working as a management consultant with McKinsey and Company. He has also served as a board member with a variety of US and international public and private corporations and leading US charities and nonprofits as well. He has recently launched a new venture as founder and CEO of Street Smart Entrepreneurs, and we're very pleased to have him here today so he can share us some of his impressive experiences. So, Mr. Killian, when you're ready, hop the floor. Great. Thank you, Kelly, for the nice introduction. And Zach, that was an amazing discussion that you just led. Uh, really powerful, interesting, high-quality stuff. Enjoyed learning about it. Uh, I put together just a few slides to capture a little bit about what I want to talk about. Just to uh, tell you a little bit about my early, early life, early years. Uh, my parents were both blue collar parents. Neither one of them graduated from high school. My dad, for most of my uh, early years, owned a tool and die company. I'm not even sure they exist anymore. I, I was lucky enough to be the first one in my family to go to college. And uh, back then I was lucky enough to get into Yale uh, to get my engineering degree, MIT to get my business degree. And I took additional courses at the Harvard B School. So certainly a good education. Uh, when I was at MIT, I was recruited by a company in the UK to go over there to help them set up an internal management consulting group. Uh, they were looking for one American MBA student. I was lucky enough to get that opportunity. And there I was working in a large public company uh, advising their divisions throughout Europe. I got drafted into the army, came back, spent two years in the army, and then uh, joined McKinsey and Company, one of the major 
consulting firms where I worked with the C-level leaders of uh, major companies like American Express and CBS, Columbia Records, Port of Philadelphia. So very, very in-depth, uh, hands-on experience working with uh, senior leaders of very successful big companies. Uh, ne next, Michael. Now let's talk about the, my last 45 years or so, 45 plus years. I, I left McKinsey, which was my last paid job because I just wasn't totally happy doing what I was doing. And I was at a point, I was about 30 years old. I either needed to uh, find my passion or get stuck in a corporate job. And the longer I stayed, the tougher it was going to get to leave because I was making a fair amount of money at the time. So I left McKinsey and I started a company called KBO, which was a firm primarily engaged in raising venture capital for other entrepreneurs. And when I started that company, I had no partners, no employees, no office, no money, no contacts, and no relevant experience. But I had a passion for working with small companies. And I spent five years doing that. And maybe the most interesting deal that we got involved in was helping Jan Winter uh, start uh, Rolling Stone magazine. After five years, my partner and I decided, I had picked up two partners, that we should uh, think of our own idea to start, go raise money and start it and try to build a company. So we started a business to consumer publishing company called Country Music Magazine. That was the first magazine targeting that industry in the, in the country, first national publication. I spent five years doing that. And then my dad passed away, had a heart attack, left the company in horrible shape, no succession plan. When he died, he had $23 in a company account and owed about $2 million, most of it guaranteed. He died on a Saturday. I started working there on Sunday while running this magazine and another magazine. And I ran his company for 15 years, turned it around, grew it, sold it to a public British company. So all these ventures on here in white are things I started from scratch. Killing Extruders is a company I bought in a distressed situation. My wife and I bought a 50 acre farm in New Jersey, went into the business of breeding and training racehorses, which we did for 20 years. Uh, along the way, I teamed up with two guys down in Florida and we spent five years uh, in real estate development, starting with single family houses and then morphed into building an office condominium and then morphed that into building an apartment complex. Uh, toward the end of that period, I teamed up with an ex-McKinsey guy and we started a B2B magazine called Wireless for the Corporate User. I stayed involved with that for seven years before, before that company got sold. Next, Michael. Then I went into the hedge fund business. I teamed up with a woman from Wall Street and we started Somerset Investment Group. We spent three years doing that uh, during the height of the dot-com uh, bubble. Uh, she continued that with a different investment strategy. I, I wasn't interested in going forward with a different investment strategy. So I teamed up with a guy and we started the Eagle Rock Diversified Fund which was a portfolio of hedge funds that I ran for 18 years. My partner left after two. I ran this up until the end of 2018 when I shut it down to uh, deal with some health issues. Uh, when I shut it down, I morphed into uh, the Jack Killian Group, which was doing coaching and consulting, primarily coaching people how to network and developing relationships and alliances which is one of the key requirements for success, I think for any entrepreneur. So I've been coaching and consulting for the last five years. And then about six months ago, when COVID-19 was really uh, gaining traction, 
I started a new company, my 10th startup, called Street Smart Entrepreneurs. So I've been at that about a half a year. And the purpose of that company is going to be to empower entrepreneurs worldwide by developing online and in-person courses and events, doing strategic consulting with entrepreneurs, uh, writing, I'm writing my second book. This one is called Been There, Done That. And it's all about my entrepreneurial experiences. I can envision possibly starting an incubator or more than one incubator and maybe even another additional fund to invest in the companies that we're running across in this company. So if you add all these years up, they come to 83 and a half elapsed years that I've been in the entrepreneurial space, which is uh, you know only possible because I'm usually multitasking, running more than one uh, new venture at a time at the busiest. I was running two magazines, the manufacturing company and the horse racing business. So if, if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think you got to be comfortable multitasking. Plus, as uh, uh, was said in my introduction by Kelly, I've served on U.S. and corporate boards. I've taught in three New Jersey business schools. And over the years, I've evaluated thousands of deals. So, Michael, could you go to the next last slide? Just to uh, put a picture next to what I'm talking about, this was the cover of the first issue of Country Music Magazine that we published. Uh, the cover story was Johnny Cash appearing at the White House. So the night that the magazine came out, we were all very excited and proud of what we had accomplished. So we started brainstorming and I decided we should get a copy of it to President Nixon. So the next day we reached out to a state senator in Tennessee and asked him if we send him a copy of our magazine, could he forward it to President Nixon because we thought he'd be interested in this cover story. Well, make a long story short, we made that happen. And within two weeks, I had a personal letter from President Nixon thanking me for our complimentary subscription to the magazine and for introducing him to country music. And that got me on the radar screen at the White House. So I've been to the White House twice subsequently, once with President Carter and once with uh, President Obama. Now over here on the right, when we went into the horse racing business, uh, we started out just by being an owner. This is me. And this is the first racehorse we ever owned, a horse by the name of Heather Nade. But we went on to buy a farm, eventually owned 25 of our own horses. I've delivered over 100 baby horses myself. And we still live on the farm that we bought to do this. So the pictures were just to give you, uh, you know, a real feel that these were real serious ventures. So, Michael, you can uh, stop the screen sharing, and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments, and I'm certainly available to uh, communicate with any of your entrepreneurial students uh, and be whatever type of a resource I can be, as I'm sure the rest of the group is as well. Michael, if you want me to go on with anything else, I'd be happy to do that. We'll save the questions for the Q&A afterwards. Great, thank you. Kelly, take it away. Yeah, so we're going to have a QA and a at the end where we answer everything. And then also, um, people are curious about getting in touch with the panelists. We'll also put out something, um, if not during the event, something after to the people who have attended. So they can reach out to Jack or anyone that they may want to get connected with. Just so you guys know, we will also be doing that. So next we have Carl Kramer, who is the data analyst specialist for the IDR, and he will be giving a quick run through of his coding and how he's going to select the winner of the $250 gift card to NJCU's bookstore. Perfect, thank you for the introduction, Kelly. Um, hi everyone, my name is Carl Kramer. I graduated from the University of Iowa in 2017, with a degree in business analytics and information systems. Sorry, I'm currently a data engineer at um, Principal Financial Group. Um, 
don't know if any of you missed some of what I was saying. But anyway, during my senior year, I was involved in an innovation center project um, with the entrepreneurship division of our business school. And with this our innovation center, we essentially wanted to form a space or something that students could use as their own configurable classroom and learn entrepreneurship principles hands-on. So the students were more involved with programming, um, events, revenue generation, and then they could see the entire behind the scene process of what it would take to start a business from the ground up and also get that exposure as part of their business education. So we developed a nonprofit through that and was also working with our university to inspire better education and a more well-equipped wave of entrepreneurs. I'm currently involved in uh, data analytics and mostly interested in data science, uh, mainly from my exposure at the university to different programmers and engineers. Um, I also grew up in a family business in the Midwest and would kind of come up with ways to improve the business, um, which were promptly shot down because they had been in business for 50 years. And they didn't really see my insight as useful. So that prompted me to get some credibility. And now I enjoy having that data to back any decision that I make um, in my current career and also realize that data-driven decisions are going to make the biggest impact in the future. So one thing I wish I was a little more exposed to um, prior to my career was more kind of like hands-on coding experience. Um, I learned most of my coding in school, but I, know, I knew people who were uh, miles ahead of me on that route because um, they had just done it in high school or had fun side projects that they were involved with. So I currently uh, mainly work in a program called Python, which is heavily used in machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and some of the simple things that I'll show you today that help day-to-day um, -day automation and things that are very important for businesses and companies to improve on efficiency. So with that, I'll share my screen and kind of go towards our um, live analytics demo. So what you have right here, um, we based on your responses from today's questions, I actually did a live work, word cloud generation. And below you're able to see that populate. Um, this is just taking the strings from, or the letters from what you had written and inputted and then giving heavier weight to responses that were given more often. As you can see, we have a little bit of repetition here. Um, mainly due to the fact that we don't have a lot of space or a lot of different words in this demo, but we thought we'd give you a little sneak peek of what there is to come and what we will present in documents after the event as well. So I'm gonna go over kind of the code that I have and the logic for the $250 gift card drawing. Now this is, again, this is Python. I'm using a Jupyter Notebook. Um, which is just an easier way to organize and segment through data when you're learning. I know some more Python purists don't enjoy this program, but I like it because it's able to chunk it up and it's easier for, for students to begin. So what I'm doing with this first block of code here is I'm importing different packages that I will need in my presentation. Next thing I'm going to do is connect to a CSV file. And these are the attendees um, of this Zoom presentation, uh, but this is a sample file that I created just for event purposes. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is import this CSV file into a data frame. So this is what it looks like when we get it directly from Zoom. A lot of space, a lot of nulls and things that aren't useful for us um, in terms of tr finding a student as a winner. As you can see, I just kind of made the students, student one, student two, and then first and last um, following the NJCU email address. So next thing we're gonna do is do a little bit of data manipulation. This is something if you're involved in data science, neural networks or anything, you will never find a perfect data set. So about 90% of your time is tweaking everything before you can do the fun projects. But right here, we're just sorting out the column names, row data, and only keeping the first five columns in this data set. So now our finished product looks a little cleaner and we're able to pull a random sample from this group. The next thing I have here is this is a sample of what this final drawing will look like. This function right here just create pulls in one line from that data set that I built previously. And it organizes it in such a way that we will see the congratulations 
and student's name at the end of it. So with that, um, for all you students on here, I will have a virtual drum roll for who will be winning our $250 prize. So I'll run this again. It looks like Sue Henderson, who's the president of the university was our default winner. Um, unfortunately to her, I would assume she would rather have this go to one of you all listening. So we're gonna run this again and our live winner will be displayed below. Perfect, so it looks like Christy Alejandro, you are the winner of the $250 NJCU bookstore gift card. Okay. Uh, Christy, uh, if you are a, an NJCU student, uh, please reach out in the chat right now to us and we'll get in contact with you with your email address. There we go. Yeah. Looks like we have confirmation that she's a student, so she will get that prize. Okay, great. So now we're opening up for all the questions. I know some got some of you have already put in questions that have been answered, but just a last chance for anyone who might have any questions that they want to submit in to have any of the panelists respond. And also for those viewers that are New Jersey City University athletes, um, I have the helper helper code for you guys so you can receive credit for the webinar. So that code's going to be KPDXU. So again, it's KPDXU. So I'll wait just, just a few minutes just in case any questions come through before any closing remarks. For anyone who has any questions, please use the Q&A section on Zoom. If you can see on the bottom, oh, here comes the first question. Uh, Zachary, uh, they have a question. So you started by delivering through a bicycle. Uh, so did you uh, bootstrap the startup or did you get any seed funding? If you did, how did you approach that? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And uh, thank you to Vivek who asked. Um, so yeah, I, um, I told everybody that I was quitting that I work with, um, told them that I was going to start a gardening company. I got a lot of weird looks, not going to lie, uh, especially coming from at the time I was working in finance. Um, and I think within probably, I don't know, an hour of telling my friends, I was going to, my coworkers, I was going to do this. Um, I had a couple of people said, listen, I don't, it seems really kind of different from what you had pursued in the past, but, um, you know, best of luck, here's a small check. So I was able to, to I guess, fundraise pretty quickly um, to get at least enough cash to, you know, buy that bicycle, right? And uh, put together some some really kind of core basic um, MVP level type of, of product, um, and which was, I mean, incredibly helpful. I'd say to everybody on a journey, if you're going to start or think about even starting a company that has a physical component, um, anything you have to make, um, it's good to have, you know, a couple of bucks in your pocket. It's, it's a very different, um, you know, approach if it's just software where it's purely intellectual capital, there's no you know, tooling costs. Um, you don't have to deal with manufacturers or, um, anything in terms of that could break from a QA uh, perspective. But, um, yeah, if you're going to go with the, with anything that like you can hold in your hand, um, I, you know, and this is what I would say to, to anyone who's thinking about this in my one piece of advice make sure that there's somebody backing you, um, even if it's just a, a small check, um, because it's a, it's going to be a much longer road than it, it should be. Um, but anything that's purely software, intellectual you know, design um, that you can sort of do on your laptop or um, kind of make with, without physical components, um, it's, it's usually an easier route. Um, but just my two cents. Uh, great. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Jack, there's a question for you. Uh, it says, was there a specific trait or skill that allowed you to be successful in a, such a vast array of industries? You just have to unmute yourself. Th thanks for the question. I think there's a few skills that uh, that I've developed that 
I think uh, any successful entrepreneur needs to lean on, uh, not in any particular order, but the ability to network, meet people, and develop really great uh, strategic alliances is certainly one of the skills that I didn't have when I started my journey, but it's one that I really have now. And it was the topic of the first book I wrote on networking. So I think the ability to work effectively with people is one. I think the ability to think outside the box, because most entrepreneurs are uh, in the early stages are often under underfunded. They lack people resources. So you got to be creative and you have to find other ways to do things that don't consume a lot of money. And I think uh, just a couple of other points. I think if you're going to do an entrepreneurial uh, program, it's going to be really stressful. It's going to take a lot of energy. So it helps to be physically fit. So one of the things I did when I got the busiest running four companies is I, uh, I immediately started jogging and I lost about 25 pounds because I knew I was going to have to be fit enough to do this. So, uh, you know, creativity, you have to have a sense of curiosity. You have to teach yourself to spot opportunities. There are opportunities around everybody all the time. And most people miss them. You can be reading a newspaper and get an idea, passing a billboard, overhearing a conversation. So you have to train yourself to spot opportunities and then bring passion and energy and fitness and creative thinking into trying what you're trying to do. Great. Thank you very much. You actually have a second follow-up question for uh, from uh, Sue Perez. Uh, what? Uh, when is the time to seek out trademark on branding and IP? And what is the best way to do it? Hiring a lawyer can be costly. Uh, it's funny you should ask that question because earlier, earlier today I was interviewed on a radio show on WOR that's hosted by a firm called Gerhard Law, which is an intellectual property firm here in Summit. And uh, I know Richard Gerhardt pretty well. And my advice is, uh, you know, go find a top-notch intellectual property attorney early on if you think you have something that's going to be an issue. And, you know, the first meeting should be uh, a freebie where the lawyer listens to your idea and can really comment and offer suggestions on whether that's a path that you should go down. So my recommendation is if you think you have something that's going to warrant being protected, get some feedback early. And in my career, I've, I've had intellectual property ripped off twice. Once uh, in Country Music Magazine, Sears Roebuck ripped off our logo and created their own belt buckles, which I saw for sale in Sears stores in Nashville. And when I came back to New York, I told our lawyer what had happened, and I thought we had hit a home run. We we're going to collect hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties. So we called Sears, got their corporate counsel on the phone. He listened to my story. And at the end of it, he said, sue us. I said, that's your only response to you? He said, yeah, sue us. And I said, you know, we can't afford to sue you. We don't have money to take on Sears Roebuck and protect the litigation. So there's two things about intellectual property. Should you get it? And is it? protectable, and then even if you get it, how do you defend it if somebody infringes on it? So my early advice is go talk to a top-notch lawyer early on. Shouldn't cost you anything for the first hour Q&A. But, but protecting your IP is important. So uh, you should uh, at least trademark your, your IP. You could do it even if you go to um, the, the websites and, and get a lawyer through the um, legal Zoom. It's really simple cheap and easy, but you should protect yourself just to say. Cool. All right. So there's uh, two more questions. One uh, is kind of directed to whoever wants to answer it. Carl, you may be more focused on this one. Uh, they have a question. What programming language should they focus on for AI and cybersecurity? Would you have a, an idea? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. There are a few languages that overlap in those two areas. Um, but I would say Python is gonna be great because it's versatile and very easy to code with. 
it's it's a little simpler um, and you can you can work with people and, and learn it quickly. Um, I also know Java could be helpful for you as well, depending on your coding level experience. I mainly work um, in Python, uh, just for the nature of my job. And I like where it's versatile in terms of machine learning and AI. So I would recommend that, but depending on your coding experience, start with Python and you can add other things, follow suit and help your code be a little more secure. Great, thank you. We actually have uh, one more question. And uh, before we wrap up, this goes to uh, everyone pretty much. Uh, uh, Vivek here is asking, uh, they are working on a startup called uh, Pack Rats. Uh, Pack, Packets? Packets is a building an online delivery service from small local stores to customers. He's starting in Jersey City. As you all have such vast experience in startups, he just wanted to, some basic feedback on how to get his startup going. Um, <clears throat> I could jump in on that if you like. Go for it. Um, I, I would definitely create an executive summary on how you're going to do that. Uh, the business plan it can evolve from that. But quite frankly, you really have to understand how you're going to do that. I, I think the, the, the important thing is to create an outline of that and potentially even look at the companies that are already doing that. You might like, want to sign up with uh, some sort of Uber or some sort of delivery service that can actually help ex extend your brand you'd be surprised how interested they may be in something that has a niche market that they can build on. Great. Anyone else have any follow-up? Yeah, I, I might add that one of the tricks to that will be trying to get a hold of the databases of these small stores. Uh, and I'm not sure that they will have a database of their clients, but somehow you got to find a way to reach the audience that are dealing with the small stores that you're going to try to be delivering Four. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of throw my two cents here. So um, Vivek, it's, you're going to a particularly difficult place. Um, so you're in a, a two-sided market um, where ultimately you have to both have consumers in terms of purpose, people who are willing to purchase the product from um, your, your customers. And then you also have an additional set of customers who are these stores. Um, so my thoughts, and this is, you know, I don't really know much about your, your business here, you, only you do, but um, the most important thing to do is to create demand in terms of the product you're offering. So rather than trying to get people to sign up to, you know, use the platform that you're developing, go to spend more time on the stores, right? Send more time to the people that are actually going to be spending, you know, developing the, the, the products, whether or not it's, you know, food, whether or not it's uh, local hardware stores, that's really where I would spend, you know, my effort. Um, because ultimately if you can create a, a portfolio of five, 10, 20 sort of, um, you know, allegiant uh, types of businesses that work just with you, or perhaps you have a certain type of way to, to discount or incentivize, um, people will come. Um, and so the, from there, it's kind of the genesis of the idea. Um, and, and that's where I would put my effort rather than just trying to get a couple of people to sign up because it really doesn't hurt, you know, hurt these, uh, these hardware stores, whatever it is you're partnering with. Um, if they just have one more alliance and, you know, it goes dormant for a little while until they can, can hit critical mass. So that's where I put my effort is into to that side of the business. Thank you so much. Um, if the, there's no more questions, Kelly, take it away for the closing remarks. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you again for everyone who decided to attend. Um, if you are a student who is interested in potentially joining the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Club, you can email me, you can look on the NJC website, and you'll find like all of our club information as well. And I uh, just wanna thank everyone, all the panelists who committed to coming and telling us about all the things that they've been through, the IDR as well, for putting everything together. And just if you can follow us on social media or follow up with us, and we'll be having another event soon in a, a few months. So definitely join for that one as well. But again, thank you for everyone who decided to come out and watch today. And uh, if anyone has any uh, additional questions for contact information, please go to facebook.com slash IDRNJCU, send us a message and we'll connect you with each of the panelists. If uh, you have anything, uh, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, we're everywhere now. Uh, big congratulations to uh, Christy on winning the gift card and thank you all for coming and all the panelists round of applause. And we have the, the pitch competition is coming up as well. 
Oh, yes. Keep keep your eyes out, everyone, through our Facebook and social medias for other IDR events that are coming up. If uh, anything else? Thank you, Michael and Kelly, for doing a good job. Thank you.